John 11, part 2. Uh, last week we covered the majority of John 11, uh, and, and if you weren't here for that, it's the story of raising Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Uh, it is a dramatic story. It is a powerful and theological and emotional story. And it's a long story, too. And it's hard to cover all of the details that are in that story adequately and still maintain the narrative that, that is so important to it. Uh, so last week, I went through the narrative and covered the whole thing the best that I could. But before we move on, I want to go back and look at a couple of the details. Uh, and the first one that I want to look at is when Jesus sends his message back to Mary and Martha. If you remember, uh, the, Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus, is sick. He's dying. And, and they send word back to Jesus, and Jesus is a family friend. And I'm sure that the intention was for Jesus to come and heal him. They were well aware of Jesus' ability uh, and, and the capability of him to, to heal, whether at a distance or uh, in person. And what Jesus sends back to the sisters of Lazarus is this. Well... I don't have it. Wrong slide. Okay. John 11, verse 4. John 11, verse 4. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death, for it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So buried in this statement is the purpose of Lazarus' illness. Why was he sick? For the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, we've already seen something like this in John's Gospel, and we discussed it. Uh, do you remember the man that was born blind in chapter 9? What did, you, what did the disciples ask Jesus about that man? Right. So, who sinned? Him or his parents? that caused this blindness. So in John chapter 9, verses 2 through 5, it says, And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So when Jesus healed the, the man of his blindness, it revealed who Jesus was. It showed Jesus' divine glory to those who witnessed it. Like those, those, when Jesus did miracles, it was like removing the cloud of humanity to reveal what was underneath. People were still talking about this miracle at Lazarus' gravesite. It was dramatic. It revealed the power of Jesus and the glory of Jesus. So in both cases, the man born blind and the raising of Lazarus from the dead, two things were accomplished. The Son of God was glorified on earth by the power that was displayed, and also the Father in heaven was glorified through the Son's obedience. And that was the overarching purpose of both of those ailments. Now, the second detail that I want to talk about and, and point out, the, the reason Jesus gives for both of these ep episodes are almost identical. And I'm going to put them on the screen side by side or on top of each other. <clears throat> In John chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, this is the episode of the, the blind man from birth being healed. 
Jesus says, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. In a, in a parallel statement in regards to Lazarus, Jesus tells his disciples in chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, he says, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, the explanation that Jesus gives in chapter 11 of this is, is a little cryptic. It's not as clear as in chapter 9. But when we read it with that clarity of chapter 9, it, we get more sense out of it. Both of these statements identify two distinct places that you can find yourself. Day and night. 12 hours of daylight or 12 hours of darkness. In, in the daylight, that daytime is when the works of God can be done. When Jesus is present, God's glory can be revealed. God's program can be executed at his will. Jesus says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And it's daylight. <clears throat> in, in chapter 9, Jesus makes it clear that there is a time of darkness coming. He says, night is coming. I think it's pretty obvious that the, the night that Jesus is speaking about is his death. Uh, the light of the world is going to be gone. Or, or to display his... Uh, he's not going to be here to display his glory through miraculous power. Or to glorify the Father through his obedience. In that sense, without Jesus, it's going to be a dark night. Now, that must have been a very terrible thing for the disciples to hear if they understood it. And I'm sure it was even worse to experience. Yet, while Jesus died, we must not forget that he resurrected. He, and he is right now enthroned in heaven and eternally alive. And in a way, he lives through us now. Uh, the New Testament writers don't call the church the body of Christ for nothing. He is alive in us. Now, in a few chapters from now, Jesus is going to promise to send the Spirit or the Comforter. He's speaking to his disciples, and I'm going to look at it, chapter 14. He's going to promise to send the Spirit as a Comforter to them. And he's speaking to the disciples here, the ones that are anticipating this dark night when Jesus is no longer with them. In John 14, verses 15, it says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper uh, to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because, neither sees him, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. <clears throat> so in this passage, Jesus promises the spirit of truth, or the helper, and some translations say the comforter. Where, <clears throat> where is the spirit of truth residing during Jesus' ministry? Do we know? What's that? In Scripture... Yeah, uh, I can appreciate that. They had the Old Testament scriptures that were inspired. Um, but in the story of, in the Gospels, in John, where do we see the Spirit reside? In Jesus. In Jesus. In Jesus. At his baptism, we saw the Spirit descend like a dove and remain on him. Um <clears throat> So the disciples know the Holy Spirit because they know Jesus. And, and I think the concept of, uh, concept of understanding the Trinity is, is a complex, almost impossible thing for us to, to understand, uh, and especially to explain. Uh, so bear with me for just a second. Um, 
I think within the context of the incarnation, um, we can understand the Trinity in the way it functioned, again, within the concept of the incarnation like this. And I'm speaking in very general terms. Uh, I, I often think of the, the Father in heaven as the CEO uh, of a large corporation, um, executing his divine plan from a distant place. And, and I can think of uh, the hospital that I work for is the largest healthcare system in all of America. And the CEO of the hospital, I've never met, I don't know what he looks like. In fact, I don't even know what his name is, to tell you the truth. And he lives in a far distant, distant state, and he's never been to my hospital. <clears throat> and Jesus functions like an employee, servant. And, and, I'm, and I'm sticking with the metaphor. But Jesus is willing to do whatever the CEO wants to his will, and he does it perfectly every time. Now, the Spirit participates like middle management. He's present with Jesus. He is, helps in communication with the Father, and he goes where Jesus goes and, and, and directs him and guides him to accomplish the overarching plan that the CEO has set for him. So <clears throat> he functioned, the spirit functions as like this connection between heaven and earth, between the CEO and the employee. Like in Mark chapter 1, verse 12, after Jesus is baptized uh, and the spirit descends on him, Mark says, the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness where Jesus would be tempted. And so if you look at all of the Gospels, there's a lot of places where the Spirit guides and directs and moves Jesus uh, in his ministry. So back in our passage, Jesus promises the disciples, what I have, what you have dwelled with through me, that connection that I have, that intimate instruction that I have from the Father, is going to be in you. I'm going to give him to you in the future after I'm gone. And it's conditioned on love and obedience. If you love Jesus and keep his commandments, this helper is going to be in you. So it seems to me that there's a very dark period of night after the death of Christ. But that darkness is going to be temporary and tempered. Uh, after Christ's resurrection and his manifestation to the believers that gives hope of a future resurrection for ourselves, there is an outpouring of spirit in Acts chapter 2. And that spirit comes and he comforts us, he helps us, he guides us uh, until Christ returns on the last day. So if we are disciples of Christ, like we claim to be, and we love him and we keep his commandments, we have his spirit with us. And we can say that the light of the world is in us and that we are guided by the spirit of Christ and we live according to his word. And if we think of the Christ spirit in this way, then chapter 11 makes a little bit more sense. It has a little more meaning. In both chapters 9 and 11, Jesus is making the point that God's work must be done while he is here whether during his ministry on earth or through us. Having Christ in you is available to everyone. It prevents stumbling in the dark. It allows you to be the one who reveals God's glory in the world. <clears throat> Not that you're able to display the power that Christ did by healing the blind and raising the dead. I don't think any of us have done that recently. But you can love like Jesus loves. You can forgive like Jesus forgives. You can humble, be humble like Jesus was humble. And you can share the gospel with others, which brings about resurrection. And in doing so, you reveal the glorious spirit of Christ in you to the world. And that glorifies God in heaven. 
<clears throat> and that's how you are, live a life that's Christ-like. The, the next point I want to make has to do with uh, Martha's confession. Uh, I know I mentioned it as being a very complete confession, and I want to look at that a little bit more in depth. Uh, verse uh, chapter 11 verse 20 so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming she went and met him but Mary remained seated in the house Martha said to Jesus Lord if you had been here my brother would not have died but even now I know that whatever you ask from God God will give you and Jesus said to her your brother will rise again Martha said to him I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day and Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. <clears throat> what is Martha most well known for? Being a worry wart. She's most well known for being a worry wart. Uh, if you remember in Luke chapter 10, Martha invites Jesus over for dinner. And while she's trying to serve the guest, her sister Mary is sitting and listening to Jesus teach. In, uh, in verse 40 of that, that chapter, it says, But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So Martha is most well known for being anxious and troubled, distracted by the world when Jesus is right in front of her. But that single episode in her life does a disservice to who she is and the faith that she has. Her confession clearly articulates who Jesus is, maybe better than anybody in the Gospels. And I think many people today hear the name Jesus Christ and, and think Christ is a surname like July or Holland or McLeod. But Christ is not the last name, it's his title. Uh, and it means anointed or the chosen of God. In Hebrew, the equivalent is the Messiah. So in, in ancient Israel, when someone was given a position of authority, oil was poured onto their head to signify that they were being set apart for God's service. They would be anointed with oil. Kings and priests and prophets were anointed in this way. And this anointing was a symbolic act to indicate that God was choosing them for that given task. So when Jesus, at his baptism, and the, and his, the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, it is God pouring out his spirit onto Jesus and anointing him for the task of being the Messiah to be the Messiah, to be anointed, to be Christ. So Jesus fulfills all of the, the, the types and the shadows of the Old Testament, the, those people that were anointed. He, he becomes that perfect prophet who speaks for God and calls all of his people into repentance. And he becomes that perfect priest who understands our hurt and can explain it to the Father. And he becomes that perfect king who can defeat our enemies and provide us with eternal security. That's what Martha was saying when she says, you are the Christ. Now the second point that Martha makes in her confession is that Jesus is the son of God. What's it mean to be the son of God? <clears throat> It means to have the same nature as God. The Hebrew writer puts it like this. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. 
said, Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. It means to be the same as God. John explains it like this in the prologue, chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The glor- so the glory witnessed in the Son is the same as the glory from the Father because they're the same nature. So even if you have, seen the fa- have not seen the Father, you can know him through the Son. And we've talked about this verse in, in verse 18. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. That means that Jesus with his manifestation on earth, has explained the Father to us. So having divine nature allowed Jesus to fill, fulfill that Son of God role on earth. As the Father showed him divine things that he was doing, Jesus could do divine things too because it was his nature. And we get the, the, the explanation of this in John chapter 5 which we've already looked at multiple times. But Jesus was shown from the Father to have life in himself, to raise the dead, to grant eternal life, and to execute final judgment. Only God has these types of authority. And because Jesus has the same nature as God in heaven, the Son of God has the same authority. And this is what Martha confessed. Now, toward the end of this, the gospel, we're going to see Jesus tried before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. And in, in chapter 19, verse 7, before him, the Jews insisted that we have a law, and according to the law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. The Jewish leaders understood exactly what Jesus meant by the phrase Son of God. It was a claim to be the same nature as God in heaven. It was blasphemy to them. Therefore, they demanded Jesus to be killed. Now, the last part of Martha's confession is this. That Jesus was the one who was coming into the world. The the intent of this is that Jesus fulfills the promise, all the promises of God, in, in, in all the promises that Israel was hoping for. They were waiting for a Savior for a thousand years. And now he's here. He is the incarnate God. He is the, the anointed prophet, priest, and king promised in the Old Testament and delivered into her life. And this confession came at a critical time in her life, maybe even the worst day ever. Her brother died. And the fact that she makes this confession on that terrible day makes it shine even brighter. As Christians, we are called to confess our belief in Christ our whole lives. And that's easy to do when things are going well, when you're on a spiritual high, and when everyone around you has a shared belief as you. But as everybody in this room knows, life's not like that. The times when people question God most are when life is hard. Why was my son born blind? Why did my brother have to die? Why do I suffer so badly if God is all-powerful and all-good? These are questions that people ask every day. And Scripture reveals to us the general reason for suffering, and it's the fall and the curse in Genesis chapter 3. But, but suffering is not always a direct result of my personal sin or generational sin like we saw with the blind man. 
No one was at fault for the man's blindness in chapter 9. And no one was at fault for Lazarus' sickness and death. But Scripture tells us that both the terrible experiences had a purpose, and that purpose was to show the glory of God through the Son. Through the Son. <clears throat> Unfortunately, when we are experiencing earth-shattering sorrow in our lives, we don't have Scripture to reveal why. And it's times like these when we must hold on to con our confession of faith. Boldly proclaim that, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Just like Martha. <clears throat> now, I met a man years ago. And I'm going to share his story with you to make a point. I met a man years ago who adopted a, a newborn. Uh, he and his wife had huge hearts. They opened their, their home to this child. And as the child started to grow, they realized that there were some health problems. Lifelong issues. So you can imagine the questions that were asked. Like, why when I open my heart and open my home to a child in need, am I going to be rewarded with struggles my whole life? Decades of struggle, emotional and financial. And it's, it's easy to let doubt creep in when you experience things like this, to question God when you don't have direct answers to why. But this man wrote a paper in regards to this years later. And the paper that I read explaining this uh, helped me under, understand experiences like this and apply it to my life. Years after adopting their child, they met another couple who had a similar experience. Similar issues arose, similar questions surfaced. And he and his wife were uniquely positioned to help them in their time of need, to support them through a difficult patch in their life. And that is priestly work. We're all called to be priests. The priests in the Old Testament were, were used to listen to every the priests in the Old Testament used to listen to everyone's problems and to help them work through them. They heard problems about personal sin, physical ailments and sickness. They prayed and offered incense before God for people. They were responsible for teaching the public the law. But most importantly, they were able to sympathize with other people because they were subject to the same weaknesses and struggles. When Christ came to the earth, he had to learn about being human. But he did that so that he could understand our weakness. He could understand our sorrow and our suffering so that he could be a priest and explain these sorrows and hardships and trials and temptations to the Father in heaven. So when you suffer and when you struggle in your life and things are not going well and you're asking why, because there may not be an obvious reason to you, Keep this in mind. First and foremost, no matter how bad things get, it could be your darkest day, remember Martha's confession. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. We cannot shrink back from that no matter how hard life gets. But also remember this. Remember that God may be preparing you for priestly duty. Your personal endurance through suffering and hardship may one day help someone else who is in their darkest hour. <clears throat> now, one last detail I want to point out before we move on and finish the narrative of this chapter. Uh, Jacob actually pointed this out to me this week while we were visiting. 
Uh, at the start of chapter 11, Jesus is out in the wilderness, essentially hiding from the Jewish leadership. And when he hears of Lazarus' illness, he determines to go to Bethany. And Bethany is like two miles from Jerusalem. It's way too close and way too public for someone with an arrest warrant and several threats of stoning against him. And the disciples point this out to Jesus. In verse 7. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going to go there again? So this, this trip to Bethany and the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead was the fuel behind the conspiracy to kill him. See, up until this point, the attempts at Jesus' life and the arrest warrants that have been put out for him have been spontaneous anger and, and religious zeal. But nothing has been organized or planned. <clears throat> but the trip to Bethany is going to organize a conspiracy that ultimately ends Jesus' life. And Jesus knew that. And this is the point that, Jesus, that Jacob made when we were talking. Jesus was willing to die so that Lazarus could live. Just like Jesus is willing to die so that you can live. So the story of Lazarus is a story of substitution. It is a dress rehearsal for the cross that Jesus is walking towards. He is a willing and perfect sacrifice that brings about resurrected life in those who believe and obey. What a beautiful story. Now let's get back to the text and finish this chapter. <clears throat> Last week we left off, Jesus had commanded Lazarus to come forth from the grave and he exited the tomb, still wrapped in his burial clothes, and Jesus commanded the people around him to unbind him and set him free. And we're going to pick up in verse 45. <clears throat> now many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So many Jews believed in Jesus after what they saw. They had seen a fantastic miracle. A confirmed dead man was raised from the dead. But not everyone. Some of them ran off like tattletales to tell the Pharisees. And it says, upon this report, the council was brought together. What council are we talking about? The Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin. <clears throat> and it's probably the great Sanhedrin, which was located in Jerusalem. So every town had a group of men who oversaw judicial matters. Uh, and the roots of this go all the way back to Numbers and Deuteronomy. Uh, back in Numbers chapter 11, verse 16, God commanded Moses, said, Bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you to, as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand here with you. So these people were drawn out to be a special group of elders. In, uh, also in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 18, it says, You shall appoint for yourself judges and officials in all the towns which the Lord your God is given to you. According to your tribe, they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. So that's kind of the root of the Sanhedrin that was developed. Uh, there was a council in every town, but there was also a grand council in Jerusalem that functioned as the Supreme Court, per se. What was this uh, Supreme Court council afraid of in verse 48? Losing their way of life. Losing their way of life. They were afraid of losing power. The Romans 
the Romans governed subjected nations different than Babylon and Assyria in the past. When, when Babylon came in, when Assyria came in, they would completely level everything and then they would haul the people off to their own country. And the Romans saw it a different way. They would come in and conquer a people. They would leave everybody in place because everybody had businesses, everybody had commerce that they did, and they would put them in subjection, but they would allow them to work so the tax base was there, and then they would send the tax money back to Rome. <clears throat> so the Jews really had a lot of autonomy, and they were able to function and and live the way they wanted to live as long as they didn't threaten Rome in any way. But what is being said in this passage is that if everyone believes in Jesus, because Jesus is doing these fantastic miracles, they're going to believe that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, that he is the one that has come into the world. Everybody's going to believe like Martha believes. And the great Sanhedrin is going to lose power because the people will declare Jesus king. They've been waiting for this forever. And if they declare Jesus as king, then Rome is not going to tolerate that at all. They would crush any rebellion that was threatening Caesar. They would destroy the temple. They would put the people into physical submission. And the Sanhedrin would not even exist anymore. That's what they're worried about. So in verse 49, But one of them said, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. What's Caiaphas saying here? What's his solution? This is the high priest. He's in charge. What's his solution? Kill Jesus. Kill Jesus and save the nation. It is expedient for one man to die. Verse 51. And he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day forward, they put plans, they made plans to put him to death. <clears throat> so when he prophesied, he actually, or when he said this, he was actually prophesying for God. And when it comes to doing God's will in relation to redemptive history, you can do the simple good by being obedient and seeking out the will of God. Or you can do evil and resist God's will, and God will wield you like a tool in his hand. God's will is still going to get done, but in a more complex way. God's will is never thwarted, even when you choose evil. Here, Caiaphas, of his own will, is leading a conspiracy of murder against Jesus. It is pure evil. But God uses his evil choices to prophesy his own divine plan. Jesus' death would protect the nation from utter destruction from Rome, but also gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Verse 53. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Now, if you remember last week at the beginning of class, I tried to show some references of time that John has shown us uh, over the last year. Uh, he starts in the springtime with green grass uh, when he was feeding the 5,000. And then the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles in the fall. And then the Feast of Dedication in the winter. 
and that's sometime around when Lazarus was raised from the dead. And now John brings us back to the spring, to the last days before Jesus' life. In verse 55, he says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the countryside to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And they were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, that he should let them know so that they might arrest him. So the rest of the story, the pressure's on. And the conspiracy is in place and active. There's a public arrest warrant issued from the great Sanhedrin, issued from Caiaphas himself. And every Jew is looking for Jesus at the feast. And this is some irony that John puts in there. Because all of these Jews had come to Jerusalem from all over the world, and they had to go and find a spotless lamb without blemish for a sacrifice. And that's exactly what everyone's looking for. They're looking for Jesus. Thank you for your attention. Any questions or comments? I know it's a little bit different than the way I usually teach, just going through the text, but I had some big ideas in there that I didn't want to just blow by. But I appreciate your attention. Thank you.